Hello and welcome everyone. Today we're diving into one of Zig's most powerful features, its error handling system. Uh, if you've used other programming languages, you've probably encountered some form of error handling, whether it's exceptions in languages like Python and Java, or error codes and returns in languages like C. Maybe you've done Go and you have errors as values, or even Rust uh, with its unique approach on error handling. Uh, maybe not so unique anymore. Zig takes a similar approach that combines the best of both worlds, making error handling explicit, compiler enforced, and impossible to ignore. By the end of this video, you'll understand error unions and how they force error handling, the try and catch operators, which are way different than try catch in other languages, creating and using custom errors, and how all of this fits into Zig's philosophy of no hidden control flow. So let's jump right in. Okay, we're going to walk through some code examples. Um, these might not be fully complete. Some of them are contrived. This one is complete, but you'll see one in a moment that's not exactly a full code example, but it's just focused on the piece that we're talking about. So in Zig, functions that can fail return what's called an error union type. This is denoted up here by the exclamation mark that we see on line three. If this function were not to return an error and just return void, it would look something like this. But this returns what we would call an error union. So this is void unioned with an error. And in fact, this example has a couple different types of errors. Open file returns a error union with a file. So it can either be a file or it can be an error. Similarly, read to end alloc right here returns an error union of a byte array. That is to say, either a byte array or an error. The beauty of this system is that the compiler forces you to handle every possible error. You simply cannot ignore errors in Zig. They must be explicitly handled, which makes your code more robust and reliable. Compare this to something like Java or Python, where an exception is thrown layers upon layers upon layers deep, and maybe you don't have control of that code. Maybe it's a third-party library that you're importing and that exception is now added to that library and you're not handling that case where that library could throw. To get comparable safety with a language like Java or Python, you would essentially have to wrap any code you don't own in a try catch. Speaking of try, let's talk about the try operator. So there are two little examples here. So there's a long way to handle this without try and then a short way with try. I think sometimes it's easier to see how they fit side by side to get an understanding of what this actually does. So we'll start with the bottom one. So we have const file and it equals try std fs current working directory. So that's standard file system current working directory. And we're going to call open file. We pass it a file name and then there's some file arguments that we're, we're not passing anything in for. The try keyword here, what this does says, hey, try to do this command. If there is an error, immediately raise that error. So if we look up here, we can see that this is the long way to do it without try. And that's exactly what I was saying. So we have standard FS current working directory. We open a file, we catch an error, we do a debug here, and then we return that error. So try is essentially just a shorthand that says catch the error and then return the error if there is one. If there's not one, continue on. So that's a little bit of a spoiler to catch, but we have a less contrived example to talk about catch. So what we have here is quite a big file. Uh, so I'm going to walk through it. So and I'm going to highlight more than just catch. So we have our pub fun main right here, which is an error union of void. And you can see here that again, we are doing an open file. We catch here and we see that we have an error type. With this error type, we can switch on that error and look at the different types. So if we have a file not found, we may want to do something differently than an access denied type error. In our case, we're just debugging a print in both of these cases. And if it's anything else, we just return error. But you can switch on your errors like this, which is really, really nice. You can also use catch to provide a default value. So maybe we're calling something like parse number one, two, three. And this can throw an error. I shouldn't say throw because that's not the correct term. It can return an error. And if it were to return an error, we can catch that error and say, hey, if we get an error, just use zero instead. Hopefully this is all making sense, but if it's not, you might want to brush up on your basics. And 
there is a fantastic tool to do that, and that's Brilliant. Brilliant has thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, AI, and more that help you get smarter every single day. I have been learning so much from the artificial intelligence track. It's a space that has been very interesting to me, but honestly, without getting into papers, like research papers, some of the stuff feels difficult to digest not on Brilliant. One of my favorite things about the app actually is the fact that it's an app. I use the app really anywhere. I found myself standing in a line the other day and I pulled up Brilliant and walked through one of the lessons. The AI lessons are a little longer than most of the others, but while I was waiting to order a sandwich, I was able to knock out a lesson and learn a little bit about AI with fun, hands-on lessons that you can really do whenever you have the time. Whether you're diving into a new topic or just doing a quick practice session, you can level up on the go in just minutes. The thing that's working best for me when going through the How LLMs Work course on Brilliant is that the concepts are cemented with fun interactive problem solving that really helps me focus on learning and retaining information. It's short, it's sweet, and it feels impactful. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash code with Cypert or scan the QR on screen. I'll even make it easy for you. You can click the link in the description as well. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. So now that you've brushed up on the basics, let's talk about custom errors in Zig. This is actually probably my favorite part about how errors work in Zig. So there's a global error set in Zig, and any error essentially is a part of that global error set. But you can create your own custom error sets as well. So if you were working with something like uh, a user, like I have here, you might have an error set that includes an invalid username, a weak password, or maybe the user already exists. Similarly, you might have a database error where you have something like a connection failed or maybe a query failed. You can also combine error sets too. So we could have an auth error where an auth error is a user error or a database error. We have a couple functions here and I'll get into them for in just a second, but the key thing here is looking at this main method, all we're doing is trying to create a user and then we're debugging user created successfully. So what does this create user look like? Well, so we are returning an error union, which we just talked about moments ago. And that error union, instead of it being any error, is specifically an auth error. And again, if we look right up here, an auth error is a user error or a database error. So you can see here, we validate the username. And if the length is less than three, that's too small of a username. So we're going to go ahead and return user error dot invalid username. And keep in mind here, when we're returning these errors, we're not using a throw keyword or raise or anything like that. We're returning them. We're treating them with the same level of respect as we would any value that we can return from our functions. Then we try to validate the password. If the password length is less than eight, that's too weak of a password. So we'll return another error there. We might simulate this database check. I don't really want to actually call out to a database. But in the case of something like the username is equal to admin, we're gonna say, hey, that already exists. We also may try to connect to a database. Again, this is simulated. And you can see down here that we are actually just returning true. But we can catch the error type that is returned here. And then we can handle that as well. And what you'll notice, if we looked at the catch example that I had back here, this catch is the global error set. But if we look at this one, you can see that the catch, what we're catching here is a database error. And that's because our connects database function specifically indicates that it returns a database error, not just any error. The beauty of Zig's approach is that errors are values, not exceptional control flows. This makes error handling predictable and explicit. So let's look at some common patterns and maybe some best practices for error handling in Zig, or at least best practices in my opinion. I've got these all listed out, so we're just gonna go through them together. So when you are working with errors, you defer your cleanup regardless of errors. So in our case, we're trying to create a file here. If this fails, we still wanna close it. You should also unwrap your error unions with catch. So in our case here, again, we're parsing our config we're catching an error, printing to indicate that there was an error for us while we're debugging. And then we're returning an empty struct here instead. Our third pattern is to collect and report errors. So in our case here, we're trying to process these items and we're debugging that we have succeeded with our success count. If we take a look at process items here, you can see here that we're returning an error union with a struct and that struct contains a success count. So while we're working in this method, 
what we're doing is we're processing each item individually, catching those errors, and then printing that something went wrong, and then continuing. If we don't hit this line, we're not incrementing our count value, so you can see that our success count won't go up. So if we send 10 items to this, and we have a success count of four, we should see six debug errors here because those did not succeed. That's a great practice to follow. Our last pattern is to use error annotations with specific context. So we have try, write with context, hello world. If we take a look at this, what we can see here is that we're writing to a file and we have log.txt. And if we can't write to that file, we catch an error. And what we do here is we standard debug print to add context to this error, right? So we say failed to write message and then we have a string and then we have a type to hold our error. And then the arguments we pass to it are the message that we tried to write and then the error itself. This makes it nice so whenever we look at our debug logs, we can easily identify what the error is and what it failed to write. Maybe there's invalid Unicode characters in our message. Lastly, don't forget to return the error. Zig's error handling system is a perfect example of the language's overall philosophy. Explicit, not implicit. Simple, not necessarily easy. And providing complete control to the programmer. By making errors values rather than exceptions, Zig ensures that error handling is never hidden or forgotten. The compiler can help enforce proper error handling, which is excellent. There's no runtime overhead for errors that don't occur. And then the error paths are clear and predictable. Whether you're writing a small tool or a large application, Zig's error handling system gives you the tools to write more robust, maintainable code with fewer bugs and surprises. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe for more Zig content. Let me know in the comments of what other Zig features you'd like me to cover in future videos. Until next time, happy coding.